everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Morgan, and welcome to Let's Talk About Buildings with Engineers. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to say thank you to PEG TV for hosting us again. Uh, we've worked with them several years doing our radon show, and it went so well. We were really excited to come back and talk more about buildings with you all today. Uh, so for our first show, we really wanted to do something special and share the reason why we do what we do, which is enhancing people's lives through a better understanding of the buildings in which they work and live. And a common dream that a lot of people have is home ownership. That's why we created the checklist 100 plus questions to ask before buying your new home. We understand that buying a new home can be an overwhelming process, so we designed this checklist to make things easier. Joining me today is the president and owner of Criterium La Lancet and Dudka Engineers, Andrew Dudka. Thank you, Morgan, for allowing me to join you today in this very exciting you know, sharing of information about the buildings that we all live and work with every single day. Thank you so much. And thanks for being here, Andrew. Thank you. Since we don't have time to discuss all 100 questions today, we've selected a few very important questions that home buyers ask us frequently and discuss with their realtors uh, during the home buying process. So whether this is a starter home, your second ski condo, or an investment property, with so many parties involved, the process can quickly become overwhelming. I remember when I bought my first home, I wasn't paying attention to smoke detectors or the fuel oil tank because I was daydreaming about renovating the kitchen. So that's why we created this checklist, to help keep you focused. You know, I totally agree with you, uh, Morgan. You know, the first thing I wanted to uh, focus on was how to make the basement into that massive man cave that, <laughs> you know, so many folks want to have or, or men want to have when they buy a house. And I wasn't thinking about the roof. I wasn't thinking about the furnace. So it's always good to take a step back and make sure that, you know, we are approaching the home buying process in a methodical way to ensure the investment that we make is a good one. Definitely. Uh, so as you're walking through a potential property that you're thinking about purchasing, keep in mind that no building is perfect. You really want to focus more on the big ticket items. And this checklist will also remind you to look for things like uh, egress windows, exhaust fans and vents, GFI outlets, and water pressure. So let's start on the exterior of the building. Andrew, what are some things we should be paying attention to? Well, you know, the exterior of the building protects the building from the elements. So, you know, the exterior of the building cannot be ignored. When you've got a roof, when you have the siding, you have the windows, the way these items are flashed protect the window, or the, protect the building rather, toward, you know, the outside elements, whether it's wind, snow, rain, and all the other things that can tackle us here in the state of Vermont. So it's very important that you take a few moments and review the outside of your building very carefully by walking around the building starting with the front and looking at the lower floors of the building and looking how the, uh, how the, what the condition of the windows are. Does it look like they are damaged? Does it look like there's been water intrusion where the window might be leaking? You can also look for these signs on the interior of the home when you go into the interior of the home to look at it. So those are very important elements so that you know that the home is well sealed from those elements and that you're not going to get surprised after you purchase a home and go through your first storm and realize that there were problems. Other things to clearly look at is the porches, the front entrances, the railings. You want to make sure that those porches are safe. There's no rot or visible rot or a lot of peeling paint because those are indications that you might need to make some investments you know, shortly after buying the home to repair those items. Now, a home inspector can help you identify those things, you know, when we get to that point of our conversation today. But, you know, you want to be able to at least take a self-assessment and ensure that you're not going to be throwing a lot of money at these elements right when you first buy the home. So those are some of the things that you'd want to look out for. Great. Um, and that ties into the next topic is the structural integrity of the building. You know, I, we really can't say enough about the structural integrity of a building. Um, you know, when you start, whether it's a 100-plus-year-old home, which we have many in the state of Vermont, where you may have a fieldstone foundation, for instance, you know, has that fieldstone foundation been cared for during the life of the home? And it's pretty easy to detect, especially the really older homes, if the owner or previous owners took care of it. 
such as mortar joints between the field stones. Are they loose or cracking or missing? Or are they in good shape? Are they solid and you know, totally present? These are little things that can make a big difference toward the long-term stability of the home. If the home is a poured, uh, cast-in-place concrete foundation, which you know, from the 1920s on was very popular, uh, what you're looking for are cracks. Now, if you see cracks that are horizontal, that's a little bit of a red flag that really should be uh, reviewed by a structural engineer. Because horizontal cracks couldn't be an indication of some failure, but that really can't be determined until an engineer can look and, and make a proper assessment. Vertical cracks, on the other hand, are less worrisome. You know, as houses settle and as concrete dries, it shrinks, and sometimes vertical cracks will occur. And that's pretty natural in a foundation and should be you know, yeah, maybe your home inspector or structural engineer, you may want to look at it, but for the most part, that's natural and you generally don't have much to worry about. Unless, of course, there's huge gaps, and that's a whole other story. Um, you might, you know, as you walk around the outside of the house, as we talked about earlier, you might want to look at the roof line. I mean, if the roof line ridge, which, you know, top of the ridge of your roof, looks like it might be, you know, sagging a little bit, you know, that might be an indication of, either just natural setting and nothing to worry about, or something more structural going on, perhaps in the roof system, like the attic. So, you know, if you see that, you might want to have your home inspector take an extra look at that when they go into the attic, if there's attic access, to make sure that those structures are okay. Um, and I think the last big thing is moisture penetration. I mean, moisture penetration, you can't always see because it's invisible. Sometimes it can be behind the sheathing, it can be behind a wall that you just can't see. So you want to start looking for signs of moisture penetration because that might be an indication. If it's been there a long time, there could be rot. And so you want to look at the ceilings. It looks like the ceilings were just painted, repainted. And if they were, you may want to ask the, you know, the seller if they're available, you know, did you just update it for the sale or was there something else going on in your ceilings that you know, you were just trying to rectify. And if there was, what's the history of that? Such as a water leak or a moisture stain or a water stain. Those are things that might indicate a problem, but again, no need to panic until you kind of look further into it. Because leaks happen and they have to get fixed. The ones that you're trying to find are the chronic leaks. The ones that are harder to detect and sometimes go unnoticed and can create, you know, much larger problems with the structure of the house. So, you know, you've got to do a little bit of homework and you've got to ask the right questions, which, you know, this document or these questions that we have, you know, highlighted and which we're reviewing today will be helpful in leading you toward, you know, asking the right question and trying to get to the bottom or whatever is going on with the home. Definitely. That's very helpful. Thank you. And you touched on this briefly a moment ago. Um, so let's talk more about the roof. Yes. Well, you know, the roof is the, the main part of the building envelope that just protects it from the elements, you know, from the rain, the snow. And in Vermont, with the large snowstorms that we can get, you know, snow load can have an impact on the roof. Ice dams can have a real huge impact on the roof and create leaks. And those are the areas where you want to ask a lot of questions. Now, let's talk a little bit about ice dams, which can really, you know, cause havoc inside the home, especially. You know, ice dams are basically created when there is heat escaping from the house that's melting the snow from the bottom rather than the sun melting the snow from the top. And when the heat from the home melts the snow from the bottom, that water starts to trickle toward the eaves of the roof. Now, that doesn't seem like a bad thing, especially if it hits a gutter and goes in, you know, just goes down your gutter and, and, and to grade. But once the water hits the eave, the eave is usually, you know, underneath the leave, eave is usually just, just air, the outside of your house. And that's typically the same temperature as the outside. And what happens is that water begins to freeze. So as the water trickles down the roof, it builds this dam because it hits the eave and the eave is cooler than the, than the other part of the roof and it starts to freeze and it just keeps building up. And this big dam starts to occur and you get this bump on the edge of the roof. And that bump on the other, uh, edge of the roof can be a real problem because then as the ice or the water hits that dam, it starts to go back underneath the asphalt shingles and starts to penetrate the roof mm -hmm. and thus starts to penetrate the envelope of the house. And that's why you have leaks when there's ice dams. 
So, you know, t in today's building techniques, they use a thing called an ice and water shield on the eaves. You know, depending on the town and the ordinances or just the builder that you hire, they may put anywhere from three to six feet of ice and water shield from the eave up to the roof, up, up the ridge of the roof, to protect the uh, home from that water backing up underneath the shingle. The ice and water shield is under the shingle, and it should stop the water from entering the home. But the older homes, some of them don't have it, or it was never installed to begin with. So you end up with that problem. So, so you want to ask the homeowner about ice dams. You know, what, what, what happens? Do you get them? Now, there are a lot of ways you can prevent ice dams. You don't need to, you know, shy away from buying a, buying a great house just because of ice dams, because they can be corrected. And one of the ways which we're going to get to in a little while is ventilation. Ventilation in the attic can have a huge impact on whether or not there are ice dams. The other thing that has a huge impact is insulation. There may not be adequate insulation in the attic in order to reduce the amount of heat entering it so that snow doesn't melt. So, so you can add insulation and add ventilation, and many times, not every time, but many times, that can eliminate those types of problems. So the roof, just to recap, look at that ridge, look at the condition of the shingles, make sure, you know, try to ask the seller how old it is. Most shingles will, you know, asphalt shingles on roofs will last anywhere from 20 to 35 years, depending on the, on the shingle that they chose. So try to get an understanding of that so that you can plan ahead in case those shingles need to be replaced soon uh, when you buy the home. And then ask the questions about the history of the house during the winter. And you're going to start to get an understanding of you know, what you're investing in and what you might need to do in order to continue to have the home be happy and healthy. So we don't want icicles on the roof? Aren't those pretty? You know, they are beautiful, <laughs> and, but you know, they, they, we prefer not to have them if we can avoid it. <laughs> so let's move inside uh, and focus on the mechanicals. Something on everyone's mind this time of year is the heating system. Well, you know, they can't say enough about the heating systems. And, you know, and in Vermont, like many states in New England or, geez, all over the, the country, I mean, you have so many different alternatives when it comes to heat, whether it's electric heat which was really popular back in the day, 70s and maybe 60s. And then you have, of course, furnaces, oil heat, uh, which is a, a boiler, they call it, uh, which is generally uh, oil heat, where there's a tank, an oil tank in the basement that gets filled by a, by a contractor or a provider to provide the, the uh, fuel so the furnace can heat uh, the home as well as typically the hot water for the home. And then, of course, you have gas heat, which is, you know, from natural gas or propane that supplies the home. That can also you know, either heat water and or air where you'd have you know, duct systems that would be you know, blowing warm air into the home to heat it. Uh, and then of course uh, gas uh, water heaters or propane water heaters to heat the house. So there's a lot of choices. In your older homes you sometimes can have steam heat which was very popular in the day where you know, a boiler or a furnace would heat steam that would rise using kind of convection and a very, very low level of PSI to enter the radiators, heat them up, and then heat the surrounding area. And they can be a little bit noisy, but they're kind of fun. They're very, uh, they're very nostalgic, the, uh, <laughs> the hot water uh, steam heaters. But nevertheless, um, what you're going to really want to look for when you buy a house is you want to look at that heating system. And the first thing I always look at is the maintenance. And every, nearly every reputable licensed you know, furnace or boiler contractor is going to put a tag on the furnace somewhere hanging on a pipe that shows the last time it was inspected. And mo what most homeowners will do is they'll just leave those tags there so that they have a history. And you would like to, or prefer to see a furnace that's been maintained annually. And that's what we recommend. One visit from a contractor to a year to just tune it up. Clean it, tune it, test it, make sure the efficiency is there. And uh, it's just operating well and it's reliable. So that in the middle of the winter, you're not, you know, have a broken furnace and you end up, you know, mm. uh, with frozen pipes and a whole other uh, list of issues. So when it comes to, you know, so when it comes to that, I look for those always. If there has not been a history of maintenance or you don't see those tags, then what I like to recommend is to have a licensed contractor come in and inspect the entire system. 
That way you know that before you buy, what you're going to be inheriting or purchasing and whether or not it is efficient and usable and will be able to maintain the home in the short or long period of time, or if you're going to need to make some investments and, and you know, upgrade it or replace it. With today's heating systems, the level of efficiency that's available for furnaces and hot water tanks or hot water heaters is phenomenal. I mean, they've come such a long way. So, you know, you may have a furnace that is operating fine and is pretty efficient, but, you know, if it's extremely dated, you may have the opportunity to upgrade it because that upgrade might actually end up saving you money just mm -hmm. on the, uh, the energy efficiency of the new systems and uh, the amount of time they run and, and what have you. So, so it's a little bit of a complicated answer to a very simple question is knowing the age of the system, knowing whether it's been maintained, are the two key components to understanding whether, you know, what you're purchasing when you buy that home and will help you make a decision on, you know, moving forward, what might I have to make an investment in in either three years, 10 years, or even 20 years out after I purchase this home to continue to ensure I'm able to heat this home and heat the hot water efficiently. Great. Uh, so now let's talk about plumbing. Well, you know, with plumbing, um, uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of evidence that plumbing might be, you know, a concern. Whether it's copper plumbing, which, you know, is the most popular uh, plumbing that's out there, where, you know, where copper or even cast iron waste pipes are used, or even PVC waste pipes are used, um, is pretty common. In the newer homes, they're using PEX tubing in order to uh, do the uh, water plumbing to, to the uh, faucets. And there have been several iterations of plastic, PEX tubing is plastic tubing, there's been several iterations of tubing that's been used over the years. Some of the earlier generations caused some uh, unfavorable contaminants leaching from the plastic into the water stream. And, uh, they, and there've been lawsuits associated with those, with those types of tubings that you might wanna find out if you have the newer or, or the older style when they first introduced tubing to the market. You might want to find out if that's the kind of plumbing that you have in your, your house before you purchase it. Um, no need to panic. It just, you just really want to know what is in your, you know, what, what, what's, in your, in your, what's in your house when, you, when it comes to the plumbing and whether or not those old types of pipes were used. If it's copper plumbing, and copper plumbing lasts such a long time, areas of that, it might be indicate, there might be indications that it might be failing. I think we've all seen it, is you see that little bit of green scale, you know, on a joint of a pipe, a copper pipe. That's not reason to panic that this pipe is suddenly going to, to fail. That, that, that green scale is just a copper pipe leaching some of the minerals or metals in the pipe. That's pretty natural. It's not going to fail. We don't really know if it will fail, when it will fail, uh, but it's just something that you monitor. And luckily, copper pipes are very easy to repair. Um, just like plastic tubing, the PEX tubing is very, very easy to repair. So um, you want to look at those things and then ask the seller, you know, is there a history of leaks? Of course, the tried and true method is look at the ceiling. Look at the ceiling underneath bathrooms that might be on the second floor. Do you see water stains? Uh, that might be an indication that some updating might be, might be needed. But, you know, one thing we can't forget is homes need maintenance, and leaks happen. And just because there's a leak doesn't mean you should run away from this house and not purchase it. I think, you know, you just have to enter it with eyes wide open, saying, all right, there may have been a past leaks and they were properly repaired, and, you know, and there might be more in the future. That's just part of owning a home. Just be, you know, your home inspector or engineer comes in to look at it, just be aware of the age, the condition, and the type of plumbing that you have so that if there is a problem in the future, you'll have a better understanding of how to deal with it. So up next on our list of mechanicals is the electric system. What are some components of the electrical system that we should be focusing on? Well, you know, in today's, in today's house um, homes, and something that I always encourage if it doesn't already have 
um, these types of safety features as GFI circuits. Now, it's a, gr it's a ground, GFI is a ground circuit, ground fault interrupter. So that's what GFI stands for. And it's there to protect the outlet and the person from an electric shock, mainly from water. Uh, and you'll often find GFI outlets next to faucets. In today's code, if your faucet, water faucet is so many inches or feet from an electrical outlet, that outlet either needs to be a GFI, ground fault interrupter outlet, or it needs to be wired uh, in line in, with a GFI series, where that GFI outlet might be in another room, but it's in parallel or it's in series with that circuit, so it will trip off if ever there is a ground fault. So I'm a strong believer in those. And if you buy an older home and it doesn't have them, it's pretty straightforward to hire a licensed electrician to come in and update those outlets. And it's just a matter of replacing the outlet that's there in the wall with a GFI. So, so that's for a safety standpoint, I highly recommend it. When you have a home inspection, your home inspector is required to test your GFI outlets where they'll have a special apparatus where they'll plug in, they will hit a button to make sure that the ground uh, fault outlet will trip. That means that the GFI outlet is working proper, properly. If it doesn't trip, that means the outlet is at fault and might need to be replaced. GFI outlet costs anywhere, depending you know, on, on the features, anywhere from $12 to you know, $18 an outlet. Um, including, you know, the installation of one would be a little bit more. But uh, sometimes if you're pretty savvy, you can do it on your own, but I wouldn't recommend it uh, because electricity can be a little bit tricky to work with. So the other thing you're going to want to know is how much, how much power is coming into the house. Now, if you're buying a home and you're planning on making that man cave we talked about earlier, and that man cave consists of, you know, two more refrigerators, <laughs> you know, a dishwasher, <laughs> And, you know, who knows the size TV you're going to end up getting. <laughs> you want to make sure that the power coming into the home is adequate. And um, you want to understand that, if that is your plan with the house. Uh, now, luckily, with LED technology, which significantly reduces the amount of wattage draw from, for, for, for your, especially your lights, but other, other um, appliances, um, you know, we're able to do more with the existing power of homes, of the existing power coming into homes than we ever used to because of the fact that, you know, we're, we're drawing less, less energy with the improvement of efficiency. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, if you've got big plans of this house, you need to understand how much power is coming in. Because upgrading the amount of power coming into a house is not an insignificant investment. Um, if you only have 100 amps and you want to add a pool, and um, you know a man cave, as well as an addition off the back, mm. uh, you might have to upgrade the amount of power coming in. So before you buy that house, ask you know your home inspector or your engineer how much power is coming in, and how much power should I expect to require if I make all these additions? And they'll be able to give you an estimate as to whether or not the amount of power coming in is adequate or not. And then that is just one other you know, checkbox you need to make sure that you consider before purchasing the house is does it have enough power to meet the future things I'm going to do mm. with that space. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, another important part of how your home functions is energy efficiency, which you touched on a little bit with the LEDs. Uh, what are some other factors we should be looking for? Well, you know, there are two things when it comes to energy efficiency of a house that you want to look for. One is how well protected is it from drafts? And the other is how well insulated it is. Now there are two things that, or there are two aspects of the building envelope system that can severely impact the efficiency. I talk about drafts because drafts can, well, we, we all sit in, we've all sat in our little office and we've had to put on an extra sweater because it's windy out because we feel this draft. And, and, and those are the things you want to try to tackle. So, you know, when you go to Home Depot and they sell these, these window clings you can buy for, the, for your window, where you, you know, stick it around the window and oh, use yeah. a blow dryer. I have those in my house. Yes, you know, <laughs> that's an indication that maybe your window is a little bit inefficient. It's either mm -hmm. dated or maybe out, slightly out of plumb or, or something, and that, that, that air is starting to penetrate that window and then the room. You can have all the insulation in the walls that you, know, you could ever ask for, but if you have a draft, it's useless because 
it's, it, it, that, that cold air will just suck out all that heat and you suddenly don't feel comfortable in your own home because of that. So drafts are big. So, you know, as you're walking around the home, you need to start looking for those, you know, signs of air leakage. How do you do that? Well, if you're, you know, looking at the front door, do you see rays of light coming through the front door from the inside looking mm -hmm. out? If you see a little bit of slivers of light, either in a window, you know, window jam, you know, right along the edges of the, of the glazing, or the door itself, that's an indication that there might be drafts. Again, those are fixable. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, little techniques that you can buy at your local hardware store to help you, you know, seal those, seal those openings so the drafts are reduced. But you're going to want to, you know, look for those things before you buy the house. So drafts are big. The second thing is the amount of insulation. Now, you know, it's hard to see the insulation in a home because it's either behind sheetrock or behind the siding on the outside. So you don't really know what's between the walls from the inside and the outside. Is it blown in insulation? Is there any insulation? You just don't know. Sometimes, sometimes a home inspector can help with an infrared camera. We happen to have one of those as well. And we're able to, especially on a very hot or very cold day, take an infrared camera and measure the heat signature on the wall. And that may give us an indication whether there's insulation in the space. In fact, we've had indications where we've had, we've put the camera on the wall and, you know, one, you know, bay on the wall, which is really between two studs, will show that there's no insulation and all the other bays show that they're insulated so that we know that, well, whoever built the house, they forgot, you know, they forgot one bay. Um, so we're able to do some of that to help the, help the homeowner uh, understand whether walls are insulated. But the biggie one and the one that, you know, is the easiest to see and fix is the attic. We talked about ice dams earlier and we talked about trying to reduce the amount of heat that escapes the house. And, you know, air rises or, or heat rises, I should say. And when that heat rises, uh, naturally, it's going to hit that ceiling and it's going to escape through the ceiling into the attic, causing those ice dams, but also creating a tremendous amount of heat loss in the building. So the best way to really deal with that is to insulate that attic. And there are many DIY techniques you can use to insulate that attic. And uh, you can hire um, contractors that will do it. In fact, some states even have um, uh, energy incentives where you can hire uh, through a program of the state. And um, you can uh, get them to come in and uh, do the insulation for you at, a, at the insulation for you at a much lower at a much lower cost. But the last piece is making sure that you don't cover up that important ventilation in the attic to make sure that mm -hmm. heat has some place, somewhere to go. Yeah, a lot of people don't think about ventilation, but it's an essential part of any building. Yes, <laughs> especially attics. So uh, we hope this checklist has been helpful to you as you start your process in home shopping. Um, the next step would be a home inspection, which Andrew touched on earlier. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that your home inspector is educated, experienced, um, and your real estate agent would have a list of about three or four home inspectors that they could recommend to you. Uh, and we would also recommend checking the National Academy of Building Inspection Engineers, and that's nabi.org. So thank you for joining us today, Andrew. It was really my pleasure, and uh, we just hope that this little bit of information will make your next home purchase a little bit less stressful. And everything we talked about can also be found online, and we hope that you tune in next month for Let's Talk About Buildings with Engineers.